Hello, handsome. If you're watching this video, then I'm guessing you're in the middle of spiking your hair and need some inspiration, which it looks great, by the way. Today, we are taking a look at the history of punk rock in the 1970s and the legacy that it created. This is part two in a series on the history of punk rock and all of the subgenres that branched off of it. If you haven't already watched part one on the history of proto-punk, I would recommend it, but it's not necessary to understand anything in this video. I will also put together a playlist of all the songs played in this video in the description down below, so definitely check that out if you're interested. Leave a like if you dig the video, and let's get started. So let's flesh out what punk is. Punk is still around today, but really peaked in the mainstream in the mid to late 1970s. Although many people associate punk with the musical genre, there's a real ethical side to it and an attitude tied to the movement as well. Punk has an attitude tied around anti-consumerism, non-conformity, and DIY ethics. A large part of the punk culture is being antithetical to the mainstream, and this is why one of the ultimate sins is to be a sellout. Also worth noting, there's a stereotypical image tied to being punk, but the culture is so diverse that you can't really tie it down to one look. Today, however, we are taking a look specifically at the music of punk rock, and I want to give a small disclaimer. I'm going to focus on landmark bands and landmark albums that are in the main branch of punk rock in the 1970s. There are some bands that I may not include in this video because I believe they are best categorized in another subgenre and will save them for another video in this series. With all that being said, let's dive into the history. Now let me paint you a picture of 1973 in New York City's East Village. In December of that year, venue owner Hilly Crystal opened a club that was supposed to be home to bands that played country, bluegrass, and blues music. That club is the famous CBGB and started to host bands that played anything but. Over the next two years, CBGB would start to have some of the most exciting and groundbreaking bands playing on its stage. Almost immediately, bands that are now household names became mainstays of this club and would play there almost every night. Bands like Television, Patti Smith, Blondie, The Ramones, and Talking Heads. The mainstream rock scene at this time was filled with bands that played 15-minute songs and were full of members that were incredibly skilled on their instruments. The bands that played at CBGB were the complete opposite. They could barely play their own instruments when they started out, songs clocked in at under 5 minutes, and the music was far more direct. And this breath of fresh air coming from the underground was more than welcomed by the younger audiences going to CBGB. One of the artists that drew a lot of attention and got her start at CBGB is the legendary Patti Smith. In the mid-1970s, there wasn't a bigger celebrity at CBGB than Patti Smith. She started out as a poet but had a love for music that couldn't be tamed. She put together a quintet of competent musicians and almost immediately they started out on what would become punk's first major statement. That statement was an album called Horses and was released in 1975. The album kicks off with a line that really goes on to encompass what punk rock was to become with Jesus died for somebody's sins but not mine. Horses is a seminal album that has gone on to withstand the test of time and has even been inducted into the National Recording Registry by the Library of Congress. Being that Patty is a poet, there's a real focus on the lyrics and the vocal performances on the album. And I mean, her delivery is as iconic as the music itself. Horses isn't really a stereotypical punk album either in that it was a lot more varied than what was to come. It would mix dark themes around death with different genre fusions that was really innovative at the time. An example of this is the reggae-tinged Redondo Beach about a girl's suicide. Soon after the release of Horses came a release by another band that got their start at CBGB, Ramones. Ramones were a band that were started in Queens, New York by a group of misfits in leather jackets. They all became familiar with each other because they were all fans of the Stooges and decided to start a band together. The only problem was they had no idea how to play their own instruments. Over the next couple of years, they honed their craft and in 1976 released what many consider to be the first punk rock album, Ramones. The Ramones had a formula of getting on stage, playing as fast as possible, and getting off in 15 minutes. Most of their songs clocked in at around two minutes and were really aggressive, but also had a pop appeal that really propelled them forward. 
Ramones had a presence on stage that made everyone stand in awe. They stood in stark contrast to everyone else at the time due to their leather jackets, uniformity with each other, and Joey Ramone's towering figure. The album Ramones became an instant classic, and on it were songs that became staples in the punk catalog. They had that punk ethos, but also had a drive that made them want to be one of the greatest bands of all time. So it probably wasn't a coincidence that the first time they played in Britain, it inspired all of the British punk bands to start their movement. You know, during, during the sound check that day, all these kids came over to us and told us how we were responsible for turn, turning them on, basically, uh, for them to go out and form their own bands. Everyone who was in a kind of band, who was going to be in one of the, the UK punk bands was there at the show. I think there must have been about 60 people in the audience, which is like sort of nobody, but everyone formed a band, you know. They kick-started the whole thing. You know? It's pretty hard to overstate just how influential the Ramones were to the punk rock genre. So now that we've spent some time in America, it's time that we head overseas and see what's happening in Britain. Ramones' impact on the burgeoning punk scene there was explosive, and almost immediately bands started releasing landmark singles and albums. The first punk single to come out of the UK was a track named New Rose by The Damned. The Damned emerged onto the punk scene with the Sex Pistols and also The Clash, however they would beat them out to be first in quite a few things. They released the first punk single in the UK, however they were also the first to release their debut album and also the first to tour the US. They really struck when the iron was hot with their debut album, Damn Damn Damned, and off of that album came another seminal punk track, Neat Neat Neat. They would be the first of the UK punk bands to tour the US and would influence a lot of the punk bands to come out of Los Angeles. Not only that, but their shift to a more gothic image and sound in the 80s would go on to influence a lot of the goth scene. However, there was another band that would come out of the UK that would light the world on fire like none other, the Sex Pistols. So to talk about the Sex Pistols, we have to talk about the fashion of punk and one of the hottest clothing stores to come out of London at the time. In 1974, fashion icon Vivian Westwood would open her store Sex with her husband Malcolm McLaren and with it they would define a lot of what punk fashion looked like going forward. In the shop, they would sell bondage gear but also edgy t-shirts and other pieces of clothing. A lot of what they sold would come with safety pins, zippers, and provocative slogans. In 1970s punk culture, it was important to look the part, so a lot of people were wearing something that would just go against the mainstream. The shop would grow in popularity with the rise of the new punk scene, and they would even go on to have some famous customers. Vivian's husband, Malcolm, had other plans alongside this, though. He always had plans of managing a band that could push boundaries and make a powerful statement. Fast forward to late 1975 when he would start to put together the core group that would become the Sex Pistols. He named them the Sex Pistols in a way to market the store and would deck them out in their latest fashion. After finding their singer Johnny Rotten, they would start to put together songs and start playing shows. Almost a year later, they would shock the scene with their first single, Anarchy in the UK. Almost immediately after, Malcolm started putting together different scandals in order to get the band into the tabloids and into the limelight. I mean, one of the reasons they were so popular was because of all of the controversies that followed the band. While they were soaking up the attention of the public, they would drop their next single, God Save the Queen, in June of 77, which coincided with the Queen's 25th anniversary of her rise to the throne. They would continue to ride on the hype of being Britain's bad boys before they released their debut album. In November of 1977, they would release what many consider one of the most influential albums of all time, Nevermind the Bollocks, Here's the Sex Pistols. The reason that the Sex Pistols are so important is because they turned punk rock into a global sensation. Their manager, Malcolm McLaren, would market them to a point where every teenager wanted to be a part of this new movement. 
1977 would be the year that punk peaked and it was because of the Sex Pistols. Never mind the bollocks hit number one on the UK charts and with it, the underground made itself known to the mainstream. Soon after, the band would embark on a very short-lived American tour. One of the reasons they never played many live shows was because the towns and venues in which they were supposed to play kept shutting them down. And then, not even two months after their debut album came out, they would break up and leave in a cloud of smoke. Their impact can be felt even today, however, as they would define what punk was for an entire generation. The same year as the release of The Damned and The Sex Pistols debut album came another release by a band that was less mainstream but just as impactful. In 1977, the band Wire would release their debut album, Pink Flag. <laughs> Wire had some similarities to the other bands at the time, but also had some major differences which set them apart. Pink Flag experimented with unconventional song arrangements and also had a focus on lyrical content. They were more influenced by the artsier punks at the time, like Patti Smith, however they would instill the power of the Ramones into their music as well. They would absolutely have the Ramones beat on how short their songs were though. Pink Flag has a whopping 21 songs on it, but clocks in at under 36 minutes. Some songs even clock in at under 30 seconds. Pink Flag would also influence a lot of the hardcore punk bands that came out later, with Henry Rollins of Black Flag citing them as one of his favorites. He would even go on to cover their song Ex Lion Tamer off of this album. Wire quickly shifted their sound after this album and later releases influenced a lot of the post-punk bands that came after them. The band's website even considers them one of the first post-punk bands. The UK really didn't stop cranking out punk legends. Around the same time, we would get another band that would earn respect not only from the punk scene, but the up and coming new wave scene. That band was X-Ray Specs and was fronted by the incredibly talented Polystyrene. Their first single, O oh Bondage Up Yours, would bring them significant attention in 1977 and would become a feminist punk anthem. Oh X-Ray Specs tend to get overlooked in favor of a lot of their contemporaries. However, the punk greats that they played alongside gave them great respect in the scene. Plus, their addition of a saxophone player set them apart like nothing else could. The next year, in 1978, they would drop their debut album, Germ Free Adolescence, which had a lot of punk bite, but also had a really influential new wave flair. They would have a stint in New York playing at CBGB for a couple weeks before breaking up in 1979. We are finally in 1979, and with it, there are two releases that are imperative to the punk story. The first is by a band that would influence the more pop-leaning successors to punk. A band that one could even say is an ancestor to the pop-punk movement that came out later. That band is the Buzzcocks, and they would come onto the scene with one of the more sexually explicit singles to come out of the punk movement with Orgasm Addict. There's obviously a clear influence from the Ramones, however, it feels like the Buzzcocks leaned way harder into the pop side of things. They had released a few albums between then and 1979, however, their compilation album, Singles Going Steady, was supposed to be their introduction to the American public. It didn't chart in the US like it was meant to, however, its impact would be far-reaching and would influence bands like Nirvana in the 90s. The lyrics had an honesty that was hard to come by, but also had such catchy hooks that it never really brings the listener down. The Buzzcocks are an important piece of the punk canon, however there's another band that closed out the 1970s with a bang like no one else could. It's time we talk about The Clash. The Clash were one of those bands that were directly influenced by that first Ramon shows in Britain a few years earlier. Almost immediately, they got to work on releasing some of punk rock's strongest albums. Their first album was an immediate hit in 1977, and not a year later, they would release another album that was met with critical acclaim. At this point, however, 
punk had kind of started to fizzle out. The first wave punk bands were beginning to break up left and right, and the scene was becoming a caricature of its former self. The Clash always had something, though, that set them apart from their contemporaries. They had a determination to be one of the greatest bands in the world. Their singer Joe Strummer understood the impact that their music could have on the public and he used this impact to bring attention to issues that were going on in the 1970s. The album that they released in 1979 was the perfect end cap to a movement that shaped the world forever. That album was London Calling. London Calling is a massive album that clocks in over an hour. Over the course of its 65-minute runtime, it seamlessly blends in genres of reggae, rockabilly, and hard rock. Joe Strummer's lyrics had shed the nihilism that punk rock had become known for for something more meaningful and politically charged. The Clash took punk rock to new heights and in turn put out their magnum opus. The album feels like the transition from the 70s to the 80s, and this is no more obvious than in the final track, Train in Vain. London Calling looks so far forward while also paying homage to Rock's roots, which is evident even in the cover, which is a tribute to Elvis's debut album. This album really closes out 1970s punk like no other album could. However, we need to ask now, what happened to punk and where did it go? The answer is that the pure punk of the 1970s started to break down almost immediately as it started. Most of the bands that created the genre were breaking up before they could even come out with a second album. The culture was also not really sustainable as the drugs that riddled the scene were doing a lot of damage. The music, however, would go on to impact everything from metal to pop and then of course the subgenres that branched off of it. Musically, the genre had began to evolve and branch out before it even had a chance to die out. It splintered off into a hundred different subgenres. However, I've chosen to break it down into four main branches, and this is how the series will be structured moving forward. The first branch is post punk and includes bands like Television, Joy Division, and The Smiths. The second branch is New Wave and contains bands like Blondie, Talking Heads, and Elvis Costello. The third branch is No Wave and includes bands like The Contortions. DNA, and Swans. The fourth branch is Hardcore Punk and includes bands like Black Flag, Bad Brains, and The Dead Kennedys. It's going to be a hell of a ride, so I hope you stick around. And that was it. That was the history of 1970s punk rock. It was a lot of fun to brush myself up on a lot of the bands that I didn't really know much about, and I can't wait to dive into the next part of the series. I really hope you enjoyed it, and if you didn't, please feel free to yell at me in the comments down below. I'll go ahead and link to the protopunk video in the end card after this if you want to check that out as well. Be sure to subscribe if you want to see more videos like this, and I'll see you in the next one. Peace.